So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Cleveland Tableau user group for, for June. Uh, we just fit this one in, uh, just got it in there. Uh, so we could still count it as a, a June user group meeting. Um, I'm Jeremy Paytas. I'm going to be uh, one of your hosts today. Um, as we go through, we have a special guest, uh, Jim Daner, who joins us from uh, Tennessee. Uh, we're going to go through uh, the, the Tableau order of operations, and then I'll go through the Tableau Salesforce integration at, at uh, Highland and how we went through that. And then uh, we're going to save questions until the very end. Uh, that'll be our Q&A uh, session. But again, if you have any questions, please put it through the Q&A uh, within Zoom as opposed to the chat. Um, and feel free to chat. Uh, if you guys can't hear me, or your gym, or any sort of technical difficulties, just let us know. And uh, without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Jim. Uh, so it'll just take a second for me to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to him. So hold on one moment. So Jim, if you can go ahead and kick it off, you should be in good shape. OK. Like you said, we should be in good shape, and thank you. Hey, I really am glad to be with you guys today. Uh, I understand this is your first virtual uh, TUG conference. We've done, I think, I think we've done three now, and they get easier as it goes along. But I understand it's a little difficult being uh, not with one another. Uh, I am one of the forum ambassadors. There's about 40 ambassadors worldwide, and actually, right now, you have the opportunity to nominate people to become an ambassador for next year. We serve for one year and then the ambassador, uh, uh, the people in uh, Seattle go through the nominations and select the ambassadors for the next year. I happen to be a three-time ambassador and uh, quite honestly, I, uh, I enjoy it very much. As noted, uh, I, am, uh, I live in Nashville, but that's not the Nashville I live in. The Nashville I live in looks more like this. I live about 30 miles outside of Nashville. That doesn't happen to be my house or anything, but the, the area that I live in looks, uh, looks quite a bit like that. By way of background, I got to tell you the truth. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, 148th and Triscuit, product of John Marshall High School. Uh, so uh, I know the area, know the area up there very well. As a matter of fact, we moved down here about five years ago from Akron, so I know that, uh, that area also. By way of my educational background and what I did in, uh, in business, uh, I'm, I'm an engineer and I've also uh, been in marketing, spent a lot of time in product management, a lot of time in business management, primarily with Rubbermaid up in, uh, uh, up in Ohio there. Now I say that because I know there's a lot of IT professionals in the room or in your separate rooms uh, right now. I am not an IT professional. And I, come, I came to Tableau with a background out of Excel and Access. So I might think about things a little differently than maybe maybe some of the IT professionals uh, uh, might say, but that's that's okay. Uh, if they catch me lying to you, fortunately we're virtual, so so you won't see their hand go up and and, and tell you I made a mistake. I want to spend just a moment, and I'm going to change my screen here a second. This past weekend. Uh, let me get here. This, uh, this past weekend, Tableau uh, changed the platform where the community page and the forum uh, are located. The forum is the place that you go. It's there for users where you can go and post questions and get the help that you need uh, to get your questions answered. That whole page has changed uh, just this last weekend. And quite honestly, I'm still learning how to use it. But I just want to show you where it is. If you've used uh, the forum before and you bookmarked a link, it won't work anymore. You have to go back out to uh, Tableau community. And we're suggesting the first time you come out here, go to this tab right here for uh, under getting started. And even if you're not a first time user, click on the tab. It's gonna take a second. Okay. Jim, I oh, think I'm you might want to share your other screen as well. We can only see your PowerPoint. I'm sorry, what are you seeing? You're not seeing what? 
we see your PowerPoint. It sounds like you're in a browser. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Rookie? No worries. Okay, this screen. I forgot I had to do that. Perfect. Are you see are you seeing the right screen now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, like I was saying, we're, we're suggesting you start here, getting started, first time, click here. And actually, I'm suggesting that you spend some time and you, they've got like a, maybe a three or five minute video that you, that you can sit down, go through, and it's going to explain you about how to navigate the new site. And it's very different than the old site. The other thing we'd ask you to do is go out and take a look at the forum guidelines that explain how best to use the forum, how to ask a question. Once again, there's a short video that will help you uh, understand how the new forum works. Uh, I've been using it now for about two days and I consider myself broken. It's, uh, it's really very different than what, uh, what we've done in, the, uh, done in the past. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the uh, other presentation and I guess I've gotta reshare my screen. I'm still there with you. Okay. Okay. Now, what I want to talk to you about today, I want to talk about the order of operations. And from my perspective, the order of operations is one of the most important parts of uh, a Tableau learning. And uh, I'm going to guess there might be one or two people out there that really aren't familiar with the order of operations or what it does. The order of operations is just the sequence that Tableau goes through when it, when it takes your data and creates, a, uh, creates one of your worksheets out of it. You think about where you start. You're going to start with a data set. And that data set can be a flat file, uh, like an Excel spreadsheet, or it could come out of your uh, ERP system or any other database. And when you go through the, uh, the order of operation, what's going to happen is the first thing you're going to do is you're going to create a flat dimensional table. And you can think of that table kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. It really doesn't look like that. Uh, but you can think of it like an Excel spreadsheet, and the dimensional table is nothing but the, the titles that are going to go on the headers, on the rows, and the columns of that spreadsheet. After that table is created, you're going to load that table with numbers and actually create the viz, whether it's going to be a chart or a graph or a text table. You actually create it uh, in the last steps of the uh, order of operation. I like to think of the order op uh, operations in three parts. There's a total of 10 steps. The first two steps are workbook level filters. They filter data out, they filter data from the data source before it gets into your workbook. So they're going to improve the performance of your, uh, of your workbook. The next three steps make that dimensional table that we were talking about. And the last five steps put values into that dimensional table and then work with those dimensions. We're going to take a look at each of these at a fairly high level. The first two steps we're going to do all at once, uh, and you find those. They are actually the extract filter and the data source filter. You find those on the data source tab. And up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see uh, you can either edit or add filters. A box will open. You can add a filter, and then this will start looking uh, familiar. You select the dimension or measure you want to filter and select which you want to include uh, in the data set. Uh, you have to remember that at this point, that data, whatever you filter out, is not going to get into your workbook. It's going to improve the performance, but it's data that's not there and you won't be able to use it. All the remaining steps are worksheet level steps. They're either filters or you're putting dimensions uh, or measures on worksheets, individual worksheets. The next three steps in order are the uh, are context filters, the uh, development of sets, fixed LODs, and the top N calculations, followed by dimensional filters. And the sequence is really very important, and this is where a lot of users, and we see a lot of questions come up, they get 
uh, users get confused about including or excluding data in their uh, top end and their, uh, in their uh, LOD calculations. Using a context filter is very easy. Just place the uh, measure, or I'm sorry, the dimension that you want to filter, place it on the filter shell, open up uh, the pill and add to context and the pill will uh, change to, uh, to, to gray. Let's take a look at what happens when we use context filters on sets and LODs. And for that, we're going to use just a very simple data set. I've got some fruits, I've got some vegetables. Uh, uh, we've got three types of fruit, two types of vegetables. What I'd like you to remember here and think about is the total cost for fruit is $5.75 and the total for vegetables is $2.63. And the top three items are apples, bananas, and green beans. Let's see what happens when we use the context filter and we put a dimension in context and out of context using this very simple LOD. We're just going to fix by type and we're going to get the total cost. And I'm going to filter out bananas. Okay, I'm going to place the uh, produce name uh, on the filter shelf. We're going to filter out bananas, but we're not going to put it in context. And the total is that $5.75 that we were talking about. And that's because the banana filter was applied after the LOD was calculated. Now, if we'd done the same thing, but we'd placed produce in context and then filtered bananas, the total would be $3.75. And that's because bananas were filtered out before the LOD was calculated. We we'll get a lot of questions out on the forum. People say, well, I want, to, I want to write a calculation that's going to ignore the filter. Tableau doesn't randomly decide to either include or exclude or ignore, uh, ignore filters. You as a developer decide when you want that filter applied. If you apply the filter in context, the filter is going to be applied before the LOD is calculated or before the sets are calculated. If it's not in context, the filters are going to be applied after. Let's see what happens uh, when we use a context filter with top end. Now, in this case, I'm going to put type on filters, and I'm going to filter out vegetables, but I'm not going to have any uh, anything in context. If you remember, and, oh, and uh, we're also going to look at the top three items. And if you remember, we, the top three items were apples, bananas, and green beans. And green beans is a vegetable. Well, because we filtered out vegetables after the top end were calculated, the top three were calculated, we're only going to see two entries here, apples and bananas, because the third entry was filtered out after it was determined, after the third item was determined. Now, if we place the, uh, the filter on type into context and go through and, and, uh, and limit it to the top three, we are going to get three items, but it's going to be apples, bananas, and grapes because we filtered out the vegetables before the top end were calculated. So where you, uh, when you use the context filter, you're deciding what you're going to include in your LOD or your top end calculations. Now the, th the fifth step in the order of operation is the application of dimension filters. And, you, and it is, I know you're all very familiar with this. It's something that you do all the time. And they come in two different varieties. Uh, there's discrete filters, uh, just very simply, you can decide what to include and what not to include. Here I took uh, uh, corporate out, and it's just simply filtered out of, the, uh, uh, out of the data set. Dimensional filters also come in continuous, the continuous variety. And uh, the usual example is to take a look at date filters, and you can take a look at a date range filter, or you can take a look at a, uh, a relative date filter where you can, I just want to look at the last six months worth of data or I want to look from a start period to an end period. And those are done on a continuous dimension. Well, we've gone through the first five steps. We're halfway through the uh, order of operation. And what's happened in that five steps is we've limited some data from the data set. We've built a, a dimensional table that we're going to fill with values. And we've eliminated a lot of data from that table. The Superstore data set contains about 10,000 rows of data. By applying dimensional filters, context filters, determining what dimensions we're going to place on the, on the rows and columns, even though there's no value in the, values in that data set yet, we can limit that to like 100 and 
50 rows. That's the only data that's going to be available on the worksheet. And each worksheet has, it has its own underlying table. So it's different from worksheet to worksheet. Now I'm going to look at the last five steps. And in the last five steps, we're going to load that, uh, that data table with values. And then we're going to do some filtering and we're going to do some totaling and we're going to do some, do some calculations. But that's only on the 150 uh, records that are in that data set. This, the next step is when blended data is brought into, uh, into uh, your table. Blending actually takes place after the dimensional table has been uh, developed and filtered. And it always takes place on filtered data and it always brings in a aggregate, uh, an aggregate value. Now, someone out there is going to raise their hand and say, well, what about 2020.2 and how do relationships work? And I'll be straight up with you. I've been working on that. I've got a sense of how they work. I've still got some more homework to do. The order and the sequence that uh, that happens in the order of operations does not change. That's when the data is going to be brought in to fill the table. So you're going to create the dimensional table, then you're going to fill the uh, fill that table, whether you're using 2019 or 2020.2. It's going to be in the same sequence. The relationship is going to change just a little bit on uh, 2020.2. It's going to be more efficient, and that's, and that's uh, a very good thing. If you're using blended data, once again, it's always aggregated and it's always aggregated at the level of the link where you link the uh, primary table and the secondary table together. Now, because you're doing that, blended data and using blended data has some limitations. And I'll be honest with you, they are my last choice on how to join data, uh, how to connect data together. I, I, I really prefer any other any other way of connecting data than, than to use blending because you can no longer use LODs. And I'm a big, heavy LOD user. If any of you got responses back from me to questions on the form, you know I use them and I probably overuse them because those LODs were calculated in step three. The blended data didn't show up until step, step six. So you can't use LODs anymore. And you also can't filter across the data set anymore. Because remember, uh, blended data comes in to fill data into a table that's already been uh, determined dimensionally. Now, this, the next step, the seventh step, is where we pick up the other two types of LODs. Okay. We usually uh, think of LODs as a fixed LOD, and um, if you use LODs, fixed will represent about 80% of, uh, of, of your use of LODs. Include and exclude represent the other 20%. Include maybe 15% of the time, exclude the remaining 5% of the time. <clears throat> now, include and exclude are working only on the values that are in that data table. And to show you how that works, uh, we're going to use just a real simple data set. I've got, uh, you know, two product lines. I've got a sports line, a toy line, a couple of products in each, a couple of uh, customers, and a variety of colors. Now, I'm an old product manager. And somebody out there just said I'm old. But uh, I'm an old product manager. And when I was a product manager, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, I'd like to understand what my average sales were by product and maybe by customer. So I could have an idea of what was selling and what wasn't selling. So I'd go look and I'd look at my average sales. Well, if I simply bring quantity to the viz and I'm looking by customer and by product line, the simple average that I get by, uh, by doing that is a value of 12.3. But that's not really what I wanted to see because I don't care about the average, including the colors. I just want the average at the, at the product line level. I've got something else that's going to tell me how to break down colors. I just want to know what's my average you know, over the sports line, and what's my average over the, over the toys line. So I'd write a LOD, include product, even though product's not in the table, include product, give me the sum of the quantity. And by bringing that in the table and placing it on average, we see that the average is 24 and a half and 31. Even though product is nowhere in our, uh, our dimensions that uh, are visible on this table. And we do that by including a value that you don't see. Exclude does just the opposite. Exclude takes a dimension that's on the table 
and eliminates it from a calculation. And uh, probably the clearest example of doing this is, is to use Superstore data. And I like to look at Superstore data a lot. But we can look at state sales. But I also want to see what, was the, what, was the, what were the total sales in the entire region. Uh, I want to see them at the same time. So I've got region and I've got state in the, uh, uh, on the marks card. And I write a statement that says, exclude the state Give me the sum of sales. So in the Western region, the regional sales are 725,000, where each state sales are marked individually, and the, the state happens to be six, uh, $16,000 worth of sales. We have excluded a value that is already on the marks card, already on the table. Include, exclude. The next step are measure filters, and measure filters are once again we're only working with the values that are on the table so we're working with numbers and you know sometime, uh, sometimes sometimes alpha characters but primarily we're working with numbers on the uh, values that are uh, that are in the table now measure filters can apply at the row level or they can apply at the aggregate level now when you drag uh your your pill to the filter shelf like here i drag quantity uh, to the filter shelf a box is going to open up and in the window, you have your choice of how you want to aggregate. If you select the top value there, all values, you're going to, you're going to filter at the row level of the viz. And once again, I'm using my, you know, uh, my sports product line uh, uh, data set. And I only want to see values that are less than 15. But because we're looking at all values, and you see we're just looking at quantity, it doesn't say some quantity, any row in that table that was 15 or less will appear in the data. Anything greater than that has been filtered out. That same window uh, opens, and you get your choice of how you'd like to aggregate the data. If you want to look at aggregated data across the table, the default is some, but you can look at averages or means or standard deviations or a variety of default values. And if we look at the aggregated, the sum value, and we still want to see only values less than 15, we're now looking at an aggregate. There's only three values that show up, 4, 15, and 15. So the, we're looking at the total records less than 15. Okay. Now, the second last step in the order of operation is where totals get calculated. Now, it's kind of important to remember that it's the second last step. We haven't gotten to table calculations yet. Totals in Tableau are not done the same way they're done on an Excel sheet. Now, you're pretty used to going to an Excel sheet and you just sum the total from the top to the bottom and it gives you the total. Totals are actually calculated in a separate mod module in Tableau. They're very easy to apply. You go to the Analytics tab, drag total to the viz and a box will open in it and you have your choice of how you want to apply them. You can apply them as subtotals, columns, or rows. Now the default value when you when you drag totals to the uh, uh, to the viz is uh, to sum, but you can change that default. All you have to do is open up uh, open up the pill that's on uh, on the marks card, scroll down to where you see total using and you can you can select the way that you want uh, you want the total to appear. Here, this is the average. So nine is the average of uh, of those values. Okay. Now, that will work anytime you're doing uh, anytime you have simple data. But sometimes when you have aggregations and you go to ag uh, aggregate the data, you can only total under what's called automatic. And if Tableau can't calculate that total automatically based on the formula that you've got in for that aggregation, it will return a blank. And there's ways to get around that. I'm not going to go into that today. It's a, it's a fairly advanced way. If you've got some questions, I can direct you on, on where you can see uh, just exactly how that's done. Now, I want to talk about table calculations and, you know, we could talk for hours on table calculations and not answer, uh, not answer all your questions. This is where I really want you to think about that Tableau or that uh, Excel spreadsheet that you're, you're probably pretty used to using. Think about the rows and the columns and all the data is uh, data's filled. 
Well, table calculations really work very similar to how you would use an, uh, tables, uh, how you would use calculations in Excel. Uh, they work across the rows, or they work across the columns, or, or down the rows. Very simple to use. Uh, your measure, your aggregated measure, sitting on the marks card. Open up the measure. Uh, you can use quick table calculations. Just select quick table calculations. Another window will open up, and you have a, a variety of calculations that are predetermined and that are already available for you. Uh, percent of totals, one that's used a great deal, year over year calculations, difference uh, running calculations, they're already there, or you can write your own, okay? And with a little practice, uh, you get to know the syntax and you can write your own calculations. Couple things to remember. They're last in the order of operation. They always return an aggregate, okay? And you can calculate across the columns or down the rows. And you can reset that by editing the table calculation. This box will open and you can determine how you, how you want that calculation uh, executed. Let's look at a couple. A very simple calculation. We've got some sales by subcategory. We want the running total down. So you can see here for 2018, as we go down the column, the uh, running total is calculating so that when we get to the bottom, the total equals the, uh, the grand total will equal the total uh, in the running total. You can also go across the rows. This is, this is what the calculation for the difference between two columns looks like. And what this says is take the uh, running total that we calculated over here in the current cell and subtract it from the previous cell across the table. So we're taking uh, 2019 number minus uh, the 2018 number, and that results in this column out here so that we know overall there was $124,000 difference between these two values. Okay. Now you can mix table calculations, and remember, that once again, they're at the bottom of the order of operations. So I can use any calculation that I've already determined in that table calculation. And I can mix LODs inside a table calculation. The reverse is not true. You can't put a table calculation in an LOD, but you can put an LOD inside a table calculation. And a question that we see come up a lot on the form is users want to rank their sales. They want to uh, determine uh, a rank order of sales, but they want to look at it by a number of dimensions. And this LOD in words says, listen, I want you to take all the combination of subcategories, segment, and year of order, order, uh, year of order date. And I want you to total those at each one of those combinations of those three, subcategory, segment, and year and set it aside so I can use it later. We've created another layer in our data set. Then we come down, and we did that in step number four. If you remember, that's where LODs are calculated, or fixed LODs are calculated. Then we come back down here in step 10 uh, in table calculation, and I say, hey, I want to rank unique that LOD that I calculated previously, and I want it descending. And then I create the viz, and you can see that in the year 2018, for consumers, phones were third in rank. They were ranked behind chairs and they ranked behind uh, machines. For corporate, phones were number four. In home office, they were number one. In 2019, phones were number one in consumer. They were number four in corporate and they were number one in uh, home office. Very often, we'll, we'll see this question over and over again because uh, consumer, uh, typical users want to know, well, how did, how did that ranking change over time? And this is the way it's done. It's done starting with an LOD that's going to give you the, the sum of the data at the level that you want, and then do the ranking against that. Table calculations also do one other thing. Uh, if you're really familiar with Excel, You've probably used offsets so that you can move from row to row, column to column, and pick up values that uh, are unique and you want to include them in your, in your calculation. Uh, table calculations also have five functions that you can use that uh, will do that. First and last are the 
the uh, first item in a row or the last item in a row or a column. First is the uh, top, last is the bottom if you're going down. First plus one is the second, first plus two is the third, uh, last minus one, last minus two is going up. Index actually counts the position within, uh, within the data set. And uh, index will also work when you partition the data when you've got multiple, multiple partitions. You can see I want the third row of data, or I want the fourth row of data, and you can identify it specifically using an index. Previous value simply returns the value immediately preceding uh, the value in your row or column. And it's very useful when you want to do some summing and when you, when you want to do some cross product. Previous value is something that I use uh, quite often. And lookup simply says, I want you to go from the position you are in the table and I want you to go up three rows or I want you to go over three rows and return the value that's there. Look up the value minus three, look up, look up, the, look up the value for the starting date three rows up, minus three, and then return the starting date. Well, that's kind of a quick overview of the order of operations. Really important that you understand that most times if you uh, if you find yourself in trouble with a uh, with a workbook and it's not returning the values that you wanted, you're past syntax errors at this point. But the calculations are working, but it's not returning the values. You probably have something out of sequence in the order of operations. Uh, I would suggest even printing it out and keeping it handy if you're not familiar with it. Uh, just a little commercial here. Uh, I, once again, I am one of the uh, forum ambassadors. I'm a three-time forum ambassador. I keep a blog, and my blog site is what, what you see there, and I know, uh, you know, uh, this material is available, available to you. My blog is specifically uh, written for people who are just getting out of the getting started phase, and they still want to, you know, they're still having little difficulties, uh, maybe, uh, maybe writing calculations or doing things the way that they would like. I've got two series out there. The FAQ series comes directly from the form. It's questions that I've seen over and over again, and I try to write them in a way that makes sense so that you can uh, you feel comfortable uh, with the explanation of uh, uh, how things work. That's where the order of operations that we talked about today is. That's sitting out there along with a, a lot of other things. Uh, I, also have a second series that's out there that's uh, more advanced calculations, but it's things that I, I kind of enjoy doing and I keep them out there also. I keep a Tableau public site. Many of these, uh, many of what I've got on the blog, the downloadable workbook can be found out on the, uh, on the Tableau public site. Most of them have how-to instructions with them. Please go out there, download them, use them. That's why they're out there. They're there for you. And uh, it's just Tableau Public uh, Profile, uh, Jim, Jim Daner, and uh, the rest. Uh, I also can be reached on Twitter at Market Analytic 5. I thank you for your time, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So I think you can take it back now. Yeah, Jim, thank you, thank you very much. And again, if there's any questions, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A feature. Uh, within Zoom, uh, for those of you new to Zoom, it's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, it says Q&A, a couple of bubbles up there. And, uh, and without further ado, I'll jump into my presentation. So I'll start sharing my screen. So, uh, so let's see. We should have a nice, there we go. Here's the Highland 3D cube uh, jumping in on your screen. Um, so yeah, today uh, we're going to talk about Tableau and Salesforce integration at Highland and ha how we went about it. Uh, I'm not going to get into too much of the uh, nitty gritty in terms of the technical details, um, but hopefully it gives you a good overview, at least as to the use case and why we did it. Uh, as an introduction, my name is Jeremy Paytas. Uh, I'm the manager of marketing analytics at Highland Software, and I just threw my Twitter handle out there in case anyone wants to follow or... Uh, Reach me, reach me there. So today we're going to talk about the use case, the, the why we, we decided to do it, uh, how we went about connecting the dots, uh, the, the overall implementation, our, our rollout, uh, the usage of it, and uh, some of the challenges that we came across and are still de dealing with today, 
and uh, some links to help you get started. So I thought a good way to kind of kick this off is with the following quote, which is use the right tool for the right job in the right, right way. And uh, what I mean by that is essentially that. So Tableau is very uh, Salesforce, I'm sorry, Highland is very Salesforce driven, meaning that um, we do a lot of our business through Salesforce. And a lot of the data that we utilize within Tableau uh, for analytics is, is again through through Salesforce and Salesforce data. So one, Highland drives our business through utilizing Salesforce. And for us, it also is a, is a form of connecting marketing, which is my team, and sales. So uh, it's a way for us to bridge the gap and get in front of sales and, and help share information from a marketing perspective that could be useful for them. It also enables the Salesforce power users to stay within their tool. Uh, their platform of choice. So uh, bringing those insights uh, to them within their native platform is, is essential, as well as bringing insights that aren't available within Salesforce to, to the, the forefront. And we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, I think we've done some really cool things and it's just kind of scratching the surface on that. Uh, also, decrease tool jumping. So what I mean by that is instead of having to go into Tableau Server, uh, and then cross-reference it with Salesforce or Salesforce Tableau Server or uh, downloading workbooks or things like that. This helped to mitigate that. And then also being able to use easy to use and, uh, and navigatable reports. Uh, and also finally, uh, one of the issues that we hope to address was create one version of the truth. So you could see potentially discrepancies between platforms. And what I mean by that is, is an example there is that will implement rules or best practices within the data before surfacing it through to Tableau server. Uh, so a good example there might be uh, campaign performance uh, reporting and, and we might wanna implement our own attribution rules that are available outside of Salesforce and those numbers aren't gonna match what's in Salesforce. So now we can actually show within the Salesforce platform itself, uh, our best practices and our point of view. So very high level, how to embed the, the Tableau within Salesforce. Uh, you need the Tableau development, which is creating dashboards and then uh, being able to filter on each object that you want to share. Uh, there is some Salesforce preparation. We could, my team could not have done this ourselves. We had to lean on IS uh, for the proxy server application as well as uh, the knowledge of visual force in that platform. And then in order, in, in terms of really connecting the dots, uh, we utilized Canvas, which is a, a Tableau application, as well as Apache Tomcat. And, uh, and the piece of feedback I heard from our technical resource is that Apache Tomcat was kind of a, a, uh, a bit of a roadblock, just to, it's a, it seems to be like an older platform, but it's the way that Tableau uh, recommended you utilizing it. All right. so. What I did is I put together this diagram. So typically the way it works is, you know, you have your, your happy analyst there in the bottom left-hand corner generating reports uh, via de Tableau desktop and they surface that through Tableau server. In the top left-hand corner, you have uh, an account manager or, or sales associate, someone that's uh, working with uh, accounts and customers and, and trying to garner garner business and they do that through looking through their their web browser and that's that's the traditional way of, of viewing reports in order to get it into Salesforce there's eight simple steps those eight simple steps are the following so uh, there's a browser request uh, the browser requests a record from Salesforce and that pings Salesforce itself through the visual force page then Salesforce renders that page within a canvas iframe Salesforce JavaScript in the browsers makes a request over to Sparkler, AKA Apache Tomcat. Sparkler requests trusted ticket from Tableau server, which in turn Tableau server provides a trusted ticket over to Sparkler. Then uh, Sparkler returns the viz embed script within the trusted ticket to the browser or with the trusted ticket to the browser. And then the connection between the individual and Tableau server occurs, which is the browser makes the viz uh, request directly to Tableau server. And then finally, Tableau server responds to viz request and viz interactivity. 
So there are some notes here in the bottom right hand corner where we talk about how the, the browser traffic in, that you see in blue is the traffic over HTTPS. Uh, the orange is traffic between Sparkler and Tableau, Tableau Server, so no browsers required. Uh, and then just another brief note there talking about firewalls and, and load balancers. So I, I created this off of this. So, so believe it or not, this was, uh, this was part of the Tableau documentation that they provided. And uh, I just didn't feel comfortable sharing this. I felt like uh, my version was, was a little prettier and it was actually easier for me to understand. So kind of rebuilt it. Uh, so the next step is really starting with the Tableau preparation. And these are the steps that, that my team and I uh, went through as, as we worked through it. So in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that I have a, a subsection of a Tableau workbook uh, or worksheet that I'm, I'm working in. And you'll see there I have the, the filter of account ID. So that filter on the account ID is going to, to touch with uh, when it's on the server, uh, you can actually filter out um, account ID specifically within the URL by providing this address. And then from there, that can tie to the same account ID that you see within tab, uh, I'm sorry, within Salesforce uh, out here. So that's, that's part of it is getting that, that unique key that ties them together. And that's kind of what it looks like through this interface. The next interface is how server connects to uh, the, how Tableau server connects to the visual force page. And that's what's going on down here. And that's where you see this trusted ticket of um, the signed identity that I think, I believe that's the, this uh, single sign on of the individual and, and the trusted ticket that goes back and forth between Tomcat and server, as well as what we're filtering on. So this account ID from the URL is also being passed through here. Uh, so that's how we got that connectivity uh, there. And again, we worked with our technical resource on many different op objects in order to, to get that to show through. So we talked about part of the implementation, which is creating the dashboards and the insights and, and how that ties together through the URL and, and account ID in that instance. But uh, for this, we really wanted to pull together some data sources that we thought might be useful. So our end goal was to, to look at customer engagement or uh, even prospective end user engagement. So we looked at these data sources. We have Salesforce data, which uh, also includes the campaign attribution logic. Uh, part not, the campaign attribution logic I mentioned before, again, which isn't native to Salesforce, um, but we apply through the warehouse on the back end. Uh, the Pardot data, uh, which includes uh, Try, Training, Community, and Highland.com data. Try Highland is actually a way to, to demo the, the on-base product. Um, so we're able to bring in that data as well. And then in the future, we're going to look at bringing in Sixth Sense data as well. So we focused on these objects, the Count, Contact, Lead, Opportunity, and Campaign object within Salesforce. And, uh, and here's the data sources again. So so we took uh, from Pardot the, the web page views, the form fills, the email clicks, webinar registrations, and, and a few other things from Pardot. And we were able to stage that data, as well as the, the Salesforce campaign data, which includes trade shows, events, emails, webinars, uh, PPC, account-based marketing, and much more. Uh, we have a lot of campaigns. And then uh, the activities. So these are activities that the sales associates, lead call, and uh, account managers enter into Salesforce. And we considered those engagements or touch points uh, throughout. So all of that formed our engagement data, which then helped inform this report. So here's the report that we built uh, based on the account object. And you can see that this is within Salesforce and, and we have a new Tableau tab within, uh, within this area of, of Salesforce. And then from there, uh, if I was to interpret this report, we could say that this account has 26 contacts engaged. Uh, they have 56 email clicks over this time frame, which is six months. They have nine form fills, 296 page views, 35 webinar registrations, 24 campaign responses, and 94 activities. So I would say overall, this account is pretty engaged. Uh, and then here we have the contact breakdown. So we could understand more about the individuals that are engaging with Highland. And each of these items here 
represent a uh, represent an engagement. So these 296 page views are rep represented as blocks here. Um, as you see that these are page views by week uh, within February. Uh, we could see that there are a handful of campaign responders for this contact. Um, but that's the way you interpret that. <clears throat> we also rank ordered the, uh, the contacts by activity so that those that are most engaged are at the top. Uh, we in incorporated this highlighting feature here. So if I wanted to type in uh, something to search for, it would then highlight those engagements down here and render everything else gray. So it really jumps out uh, in terms of what we're looking for. And then this hamburger button here uh, expands into more additional filters that are available to the end user uh, to find out more information or to filter out this population uh, based on what they're looking for. And then finally, uh, we have this tool tip that gives, again, additional information. So within this account, this contact score is very high in terms of engagement and recency. So that's where you'll see the five flames for engagement and the five, five flames for recency. We can see the activity, they went to the community site, uh, it was a page path, um, uh, it was a page view, and we see what they're looking for. Uh, we can see that this uh, opportunity, I'm sorry, this contact is not associated with any current opportunities. So maybe there is a, a, an opportunity to add this contact to an opportunity. And if we want to see that, that, that web page itself, we can click on that hyperlink there and it'll take us directly to the web page that they were viewing. So that's the account object. On the contact object, it's very similar. We have some, some contact specific metrics here. And we can also see the campaigns at, at the very bottom that they were associated with and that they're engaging with. So we have a breakout of, of that uh, contact. We also have it on the lead object as well. Talking about things that aren't native to Salesforce that we wanted to bring through is a lead score that we've uh, generated outside of Salesforce, but using Salesforce data. Um, and we're able to surface that through here. So we can see that there's a marketing lead scoring model for this lead based on the interactions to this point. Uh, looking at an opportunity, uh, we're looking at this opportunity and all of its engagements throughout um, and all of the, the touch points uh, throughout. Uh, what you see bubbled up in, uh, in pink, we consider uh, those, are, those are resulting from a stage change and we can see every campaign interaction on this opportunity. Uh, so 49 campaigns have influenced this opportunity, which is, which is a very good sign. And then we can actually drill into more information about the campaign itself. Um, you know, who the person was, what their title was, and, and uh, everything that they've um, interacted with uh, throughout. So those are the tool tips that we've built out. Here's a campaign, uh, campaign view that we've built out looking at campaign membership. So whether it's a lead or contact, uh, whether they responded or whether those leads became contacts. And you can see that at the very top and broken out by things that are important to Highland. So what are, what are the different verticals or what region? Um, that middle area is actually uh, opportunity influence, which is something that we care about uh, in terms of how many opportunities were, were touched uh, by this campaign. So individuals are attached to opportunities and that's how we go about doing that. We have our, our demand waterfall down in the bottom left. Uh, so how many um, sales accepted leads were, were generated from this campaign? And then you'll see here at the top, we have this uh, list of influenced opportunities. So the end user can actually jump in and see the individual opportunities there uh, and whether or not this campaign played a role uh, in terms of a, a major touch point, which would be the first touch on an opportunity, uh, contact creation, uh, opportunity creation, or a closed deal. So the, the next question is, well, how do we go about rolling that out? What we did is we, we identified a pilot group, uh, people within sales and marketing, uh, again, the lead quality team, sales associates uh, from a marketing perspective, program managers, campaign managers, working with our demand team as well as digital. And we created a feedback loop and uh, Allah actually did a really nice job of, of doing this. So uh, she created a template for soliciting that feedback and, uh, and asking some questions throughout and also providing training sessions on the end users on how to navigate these reports. So, um, 
we also got a lot of a lot of requests to access these types of uh, these types of reports, and uh, that was part of our role as well is working with IS and making sure that we're in coordination of the the Tableau and Salesforce uh, access, as well as working with uh, Sales Academy. So we have internal training for our sales team called Sales Academy, and working with them to better train uh, our sales team on on these reports and how they work. So some of the early feedback is yes, overall it's wonderful. Um, it'll be nice to have something included in our monthly business reviews. Uh, some of the constructive criticism uh, is you know, the opportunity con count on the contact record. It could be a little bit confusing. So we're gonna take that back and, and take that feedback and, and work on it. Um, some people mentioned uh, that the viewing on a laptop could be a bit difficult. Uh, so again, that's that's things that we need to work on on our end to, to try to work with the formatting within Tableau to make that easier. And then for the future, one of the things that we'd really like to do is to be able to track usage. So talk about on an XYZ opportunity, who utilized this and, and how did that opportunity um, fare? Did, did it close? Did it did we lose it? Um, did it advance in stages in terms of the, the information that was available and based on using the report? And we're also talking about expanding to, to other objects. So based on what you've seen before is creating like a, a culmination of a, uh, of like a water cooler type report that really boils it up. Uh, so an account manager can jump right in and say, okay, this account is doing well, this one not so much. Um, maybe I need to re reach out to them. So some of the challenges uh, that we've come across, the documentation is a bit dated. Uh, so this is one of the one of the things that pops up when you when you search for it, and you'll see that uh, that's from November 2013. So a little bit dated there. Uh, there is a need for additional support. Again, me and my team we couldn't do it ourselves, so we needed uh, more technical resources. And for us, it was a challenge to try to align those resources. Uh, the other thing we had to, to focus on was the consistency in the dashboard builds. So while I'll be, I built one, um, we had two other team members that were working through and developing dashboards. So trying to, con to be consistent as we build out in terms of the look, the feel, and the interactions, uh, it was a challenge, but I think it was a good challenge for us. And I think we worked through it rather well. Uh, I mentioned formatting before, so we actually had to disable the toolbars that are native within Tableau Server. Um, I'm hoping that we could add them back in because it adds some, some more functionality for the end user. And then we also had to avoid uh, some of the fixed options. So within the layout containers and the, the fixed height and, height, height and width, uh, we had to play with a little bit there. So if you're interested in getting started, here's some valuable resources. Again, the, uh, the Salesforce Canvas adapter, uh, the article that I uh, shared before, which is embedding Salesforce within analytics. And then a gentleman named Aaron Winters actually had a, a, good, um, a good blog about his approach in terms of embedding uh, Tableau within Salesforce. And then I recommend working with your Tableau representative uh, we worked with ours and she was able to point us to the right people and provide support and really, really help us, help us with that. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm right at the five o'clock mark. So uh, I think we're in good shape and I'll open it up to, to any questions that, uh, that we might have. Hey, Jeremy. So um, we had one question from Nick, which was, um, can you send your flowcharts to Tableau for their use? The one that you made. And your foot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I absolutely could. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Um, and that was really the only question that got sent in, but I have a couple of additional questions. Um, that was a, an excellent presentation, both of you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, for Jeremy, I presume all the users who have access to um, the reports that you built inside of Salesforce. Um, also have to have Tableau licenses in order to access those, right? That is correct, yep. Um, and have you had to deal with any sort of permission-based things in terms of who can see which reports and how you manage that? You know, that's a good question. Not yet. I think when we do get into the account, um, the account manager view, we might want to get that, um, provide some of the, the user 
or the role-based per permissions. Um, yeah, we'll probably probably implement that as well. The nice thing is is uh, with through through the use of the URLs um, and Visual Force and all that, I, I do believe that you're able to connect those dots and say, okay, we'll filter based on this person's login as well. But but that is something that we're going to have to figure out sooner than later. I have one more question, which may be uh, not the best question for the Tableau user group, but uh, did you consider using Einstein Analytics for that? Um, that is a good question. And it is relevant now because uh, Salesforce owns Tableau, right? Um, and, and I'm sure it's something that will come along. Um, honestly, no. I think uh, I think we probably could have. I think our comfort level within our team is within Tableau, and and again, kind of kind of using some of that, um, really relying on on the data from the warehouse, which is which is what we did. Um, no, we didn't we didn't really consider Einstein, but uh, well, maybe we should have. <laughs> we are trying to do something. Um trying to build some reporting in Einstein now, and I was just, we also use Tableau, obviously, so I was just curious. Um, <laughs> we have another question that came in. Will source, Salesforce replace Tableau with another similar tool like Einstein? Will Salesforce replace Tableau with another? Not that I know of. Again, I'm not a, I don't have the inside scoop, but um, I think that they're committed to, to Tableau. They bought them for a reason. As far as I can tell, so I, I don't, I don't think, I don't see Tableau going away anytime soon. Do you have any thoughts on that, Jim? Uh, I have, you know, there's something, something really I have to say, and I forgot to put it in there. I have to say that I'm not a Tableau employee, and I can't make commitments for them. <laughs> and no, no, really, I have to say that at the start of a presentation. So some lawyers are going to sleep well tonight. Uh, I really have no insight into that, and I agree with you. They bought Tableau for some reason, it, 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 not for some reason, for a lot of reasons. Uh, so no, it would be a surprise to me. I don't know. All right. Well, if that's it for the questions, um, I really appreciate everyone's time. Um, I think we went pretty well, uh, all things considered, for our first uh, virtual meeting. Lauren, thank you for taking the questions. Jim, thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. Um, we're hoping to get one again in probably probably a couple months. I think the, the every other month cadence is working out. Um, but please join us on LinkedIn, where uh, the Cleveland Tableau user group, you can find us there. Uh, if you want to join and follow and, and be in tune with every uh, with all the, the meetings that are that are coming up. And uh, any any parting words, Jim? Uh, I'm just going to put in a plug for two things. First of all, go on out to the forum, go on out to the new community page, provide feedback. Uh, love to see you out there. Uh, we're out there to help you. That's that's why we're there. Second, if you haven't sat in on any of the Data Fam uh, community jams, they're excellent, and it's your opportunity to hear people that you wouldn't you would never have an access to unless you went to unless you went to convention uh, there's been some tremendous presentations out there so take advantage of that while you can it's one of the advantages of not being live we're we're virtual so uh, so you can get people that you wouldn't otherwise get okay yeah, that, and thank you very much I enjoyed the opportunity yeah yeah and Jim, Jimmy bring up a great point about um, looking at resources so that reminded me of two things one is if anyone's interested in tableau prep there is a Tableau prep user group that meets like every other month. And I found, I found that to be really useful. I use it intermittently and I use it for uh, teaching. Um, but Jonathan Drummy presented at the last one. He did a great job. So, so that was great. And I think we're at the tail end of the, the Tableau um, free learning. I think that is yeah, I could... the ends today. Yeah, it ends today. I can, I, I can speak to that. I can, uh, and just two points. Uh, I know I I uh, do some work with those people. Okay, let's just leave it at that. I did the, the people that do the e-learning. I do some work with them. They had over a hundred thousand people take advantage of that opportunity. Okay, so yeah, yeah, really, and it's been great, and we've seen a lot of questions, and it's really good. It does end today. 
if uh, you may still be able to sneak in and you still get the full 90 days. So it was 90 days worth of free e-learning. Uh, you can sign up for today and you can still get the full 90 days, but it does end, uh, it does end today. Uh, you mentioned prep. There is a group out of London. They've got a site prepping data. If you want to learn how to use prep, go out to prepping data. They have a challenge. Every week there's a new challenge. I would suggest starting at week one, because if you dive in at week whatever we're in now, it's going to be pretty tough. Excellent. And thank you to, um, uh, if you look in the chat, uh, we have a, uh, there is the link to it. So thank you. For uh, prepping data? Yeah, yeah, prep. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pre pre prepping data is the prep equivalent to Makeover Monday. Got it. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, well, thanks again, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evenings and, uh, and take care.